Hey everybody out there in the listening world, thanks for tuning in. My guest on this episode is First Lieutenant Vance Lenny, and we discuss 2019's one-shot war film, 1917, starring George Mackey and Dean Charles Chapman. Uh, Just want to give a shout out to everybody that participated in our winter giveaway. Really appreciate that. Uh, We will be doing another one here shortly, maybe spring, summertime, I'm thinking, Uh, but definitely before the end of season two, so stay tuned for that. If you didn't see who won, check out our YouTube channel. And uh, you can see our live drawing, although it will no longer be live. Uh, also, check out my top 10 movies that I've covered on the podcast. It's it's really interesting, you know, when you're forced to rank a bunch of movies that maybe aren't the best. But either way, really appreciate you guys listening. And uh, on with the show. Well, thank you very much for being my guest today, Vance. I really appreciate it. Long time no talk. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. How are things going with you? Uh, they're going well. Um, you know, just living a dream. Living the dream, as That's I said. That's great, man. <laughs> That's great. So you picked uh, a relatively recent movie, uh, 2019, so <clears throat> less than a year ago. Uh, the movie is 1917. What What made you pick this movie? So it was very hard for me to pick a movie, actually. Like, there's so many movies that I, like, wanted to talk about and, like, could talk about. But then I watched this movie. So my first choice was Extraction. And then I watched this movie, and it, I was just like, wow, I, I wanted to I want to do this movie. So I wanted to do, with you, I wanted to do, like, a military movie. Because, you know, you were in the Marines, I'm in the Marines. I feel like we've never really talked about even your experiences in the Marine Corps or any of that. Mm-hmm. Like. Which I think is kind of stupid. Like, I was going into the Marine Corps, and I never got, like, your take on what being a Marine was like about to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, that's yeah, kind of... Yeah, so, so we we met, uh, we worked together at a, at a video store. You were getting ready to join uh, the Marine Corps. I had just gotten out. Um, it was my first job out of the military. And, uh, and yeah, I think, you know, we, we hit it off. We became friends. Uh, I'm unfortunately we didn't we didn't stay much in contact after that. So it's been a couple of years since we've spoken. But um, you know I have I have followed you with with great admiration on Facebook, and you became an officer. So I, I mean I'm really thank you very much for your service. Um, and I, I was excited you picked this movie because ironically enough, I don't I don't like to steer my guests towards one movie or the other. I like to leave it open ended because I think you know part of of the initial conversation I like to have on the podcast is what made you pick the movie. You know I've I, so often I get asked by people, um, you know, guests, you know, what, what movie should I do? Or, you know, should I do a movie I've seen before? Or should I do a movie I haven't seen or so on? And, and some people approach it differently. Some people want it to be a movie that, you know, neither one of us have seen and we're talking about it fresh with, with fresh eyes. Other people are like, you know, this is a movie I saw. You got to watch it. It's amazing. And um, I have yet I have yet to have somebody pick a movie they didn't like purely for, you know, <laughs> to, to bash it. But I'm sure it'll come eventually. Yeah. But ironically enough, oh. you picked this movie, and I, the first time I saw this was like two months ago. Um, so it, I had seen it once before, but relatively recently. So I, I did watch it again for the podcast, and I mean, we'll, we'll get into we'll get into my thoughts on the movie and your thoughts on the movie. Um, one of the things I like to do is the the podcast itself. We're going to be talking about the movie. We're going to be going through the plot, and um, ultimately, I'm sure we're going to reveal throughout what our thoughts are on the movie, but ultimately the question that we're trying to get to is, was this a good movie? And that's such, such a subjective question. Um, but I think what's ironic is that me and you do have that background, not only in the military, which is the military movie we're talking about, but we also have that background in, in a movie store you know, and movie lovers. So yeah, I'm anxious to get your take on this. So was this, this is the first time you saw this movie or did had you seen it before? So <clears throat> I think I had already, uh told you that i wanted to do extraction and then i saw the movie like right after so i saw it pretty recently like um maybe a month or two ago and then uh yeah then i switched so then i watched it again um 
uh, recently, but I, I've only just seen it pretty recently. Nice. So Sam Mendes, he's the director on this. Um, he also directed Skyfall, uh, Spectrum, or Sp- Spectre, uh, which is a two Jane Bond movie. Um, he also directed Revolutionary Road, <coughs> Road to Perdition with um, Tom Hanks, oh, uh, one, of the, one of the great Tom Hanks movie. He also directed Jarhead. Have, have you seen Have you seen Jarhead? Yes. Have you yeah, so. Did you read the book? No. Okay, so interesting. You you, you want to get some some takes on on me and my experience in the military. So when I was in MOS school at Meridian, Mississippi, to become a seventy forty one. Um, what is that? In order to get uh, aviation operations specialist, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> flight control tower people. Yeah, um, yeah. I didn't do any of that. Like like most Marines, I went to school for one thing and ended up doing a completely different thing in the fleet. But regardless, um, I'm in MOS school and I, I'm trying to be a shit hot Marine. And I asked my my instructor. I said, "What can I do to earn you know better pro and cons or, or whatever?" And he said, "You can do a book report." You know, you pick something off the commandant's reading list, and you can do a book report on it, and that'll help with your pros and pros and cons. So I ended up picking Jarhead. I read it and did a book report on it, and then about a year later, it was greenlit and came out uh, on on in a movie. The book is ten times better than the movie, as they usually are, <laughs> but the the book is so much more about his life after the Marine Corps, whereas the movie takes place mainly you know during his tours in Iraq, but. Um, but regardless, Sam Mendes uh, decides that he has this idea for a movie taking place during World War One. Uh, not a lot of World War One movies, so heavily movies are centered around World War Two, uh, mainly because Americans like to watch war movies that America was in, and um, <laughs> America did not enter World War Two or World War One until you know the date. August 6th, 1917. That's the day this movie takes place. So when the movie opens up, it's a date that flashes across the screen, and it's the day this movie takes place. Um, It really is irrelevant to the the movie. Um, The events that take place in the movie are a real thing. The um, Germans retreating to a predetermined line that they had already set up, well-fortified, three miles thick, but anyway, Sam Mendes has this idea for a movie about World War One. In addition to that, Sam Mendes' grandfather was a messenger in World War One. One of the things I found the most interesting about World War One is World War One is really the only war that starts with cavalry and horseback riding and ends with tanks and machine guns. I mean, there's such a technology jump during World War One that it's it's amazing. I mean, what, and, how, the, and the first get, close air support. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get the dog fighting that never took place before. Um, I want to say like U boats and submarines are more World War Two, but I've got to imagine that there's some sort of version of that technology, you know, at least uh, lingering around here. So he has this idea. I'm going to combine these this, these stories that I've heard as a kid from my grandfather about all these little messenger trips that he did. Um, you know, you, you get a great scene early on in the movie of the grapevines in the um, in the trenches. You know, a lot of people don't know the the term. You know, heard it through the grapevine comes from those wires that were in the trenches that would you know do Morse code and radio signals and stuff like that. So. Oftentimes it was referred to as the grapevine, and so you would hear things through the grapevine. So give me some context for you being in the military, seeing this movie, and seeing some <clears> of <throat> the technology in this movie. I mean, I want to get into the the graphic stuff later, but as far as the weaponry and the trenches and stuff like that, what, what, were, what were some of the feelings you were having watching some of that stuff? So uh, the first thing... Uh, like you notice from the first scene right is when they're sitting in that field and it's like beautiful lush like and then not 10 feet from where they are is just this completely different world of like these trenches like where it's just like you you have this beautiful backdrop and then like they walk down and all of a sudden you're like oh like <laughs> damn <laughs> and they're just like in these disgusting like muddy trenches and like um like we for us like the the closest you get to that is like digging out a fighting hole 
Um, and that's like a little two man pit. Like you have the parapet sand sandbags around, um, and you have to place your weapons. And like, uh, but like they they don't even have that. It's just like over the top of the trench, and they just try to shoot. So um, <laughs> it's just crazy to think that like like they dug all those out to just sit in them for for like months and months. Yeah, uh, like us now, like we're you know very mobile i say in air quotes um like i was light armor reconnaissance so um, i was in vehicles like people like to call them tanks but they're you know basically armored cars uh with a big turret so like we're always on the move like never really we'll dig in uh the vehicle sometimes but like these guys were just chilling in mud for days and days yeah, I remember one of the big things that they were trying to preach to us in boot camp was uh, to make sure you switch your socks because submersion foot is, you know, a killer. And uh, a lot of that comes from from this sort of old time, um, you know, World War II, Vietnam War and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, the, the I think the war aspects of this movie, the technology bringing you back to World War One, is so interesting and so real um one of the things that i think it's really hard for civilians to understand is being in the military there's a certain mindset that i think you have to have and part of the things that you psychologically have to deal with whether you've seen combat or not part of the things you psychologically have to deal with while entering the military is the idea that you could die and yeah. you could kill somebody and these are things that a lot of military guys don't like to talk about um, at, at least, I mean, it's starting to become more of a conversation, um, as we address some of the, uh, you know, veteran suicide and stuff like that. Um, uh, but, but not to get, not to make it too dark. I think you watch movies like this and you see a bunch of kids, a bunch of, you know, 20 something year olds, even younger, and they're literally living in a, in a ditch in the ground for months at a time. And some of these guys that he encounters in the movie, especially early on, are there. There's there's something off about them because of what the toll this takes psychologically on you, um, and that that's really surreal, in my opinion. Yeah, I think this movie did a good job with uh, uh, like just the look on all their faces while you're walking past, like just. You know the guys off to the side you can see like the despair and like the like what the fuck am i doing here which is which is real like i've seen that and in, in less than half of the conditions that these guys are yeah, um, yeah and, absolutely and like you feel it when they're walking past these guys like i can feel it in my soul yeah there's a great scene towards the end of the movie and i don't want to i don't want to get too jump jumped around but there's a great scene towards the end of the movie where he's running along um, a bunch of guys that are, are essentially on the embankment of the yeah. um, of the ditch, and they're getting ready to go over the top. And you know, you, there's a, there's a sense of suspense in the movie. But you look at these guys, and you just think like they are standing there, crouched down, waiting for a whistle to blow, so they could actively run towards a bunch yeah. of people whose weapons yeah. are aimed directly at them, and just yeah. hope that I can dodge a bullet fast enough to to make it far <laughs> enough to do some good. Um, but one of the other great aspects of this movie above and beyond the military aspect, above and beyond the combat and the world war one and the you know real stories that came from his grandfather is Sam Mendez has this idea that I want to write this movie and I want this movie shot as one continuous yeah. shot, which is a huge undertaking. I mean, the average film has over 300 different cuts. I mean, you look at, you look at a, a film that has dialogue and you're flashing back and forth between two people talking. Each one of those is a different cut. A lot of times, each one of those is shot separately and spliced together. In this movie, he says, from the moment the, mo the film starts, which is, like you said, two guys basically chilling on the edge of a field, um, trying to catch some shut-eye in the middle of the day. From, the, from that moment to the final scene, it's shot as one continuous, the camera doesn't come off the main character or characters as they go on this journey. That, from, from a film lover standpoint, is amazing. What, from, yeah. from, a film, from a film person yourself, what were your thoughts on that? 
I, that's like what made me fall in love with this movie to be honest um like it actually built suspense like this the the few scenes where um like when they go over and they're going to check like a trench and it, the camera pans around so like you don't even see like really what they see but you see them as they come over like ready to go like every time that happened you're just like i'm just like sitting back like Oh, what's gonna be there? What's gonna be there? Like it actually like built suspense in like a real way because it felt like I was there. Yeah, and I it's, think that's that's what I love so much about the movie. I couldn't agree more, and I think that's part of the reason why he wanted to shoot it as one take is because he wants you to be in that. There, there is no relief. So the, yes. the movie starts off, and you have these two gentlemen in a field. Um, one of it's played by Dean Charles Chapman. He plays Lance Corporal Blake. And then you have George uh, McKay plays Lance Corporal Schofield, Schofield, I believe is how you pronounce it. Yeah. Um, originally, Tom Holland, Spider-Man, was supposed to be uh, hooked onto this movie. Uh, scheduling conflict, he ended up having to back out. But it would have been very interesting to see him in this role as well. Um, but the two of them are brought in. Yeah, I, I believe so. I think it was Schofield, um, possibly Blake. I'm not sure, but definitely one of the two main characters. So they are they are brought in front of um, the general, uh, General McKay, who is played by Colin Firth, a phenomenal actor. Uh, um, excuse me, General uh, Erdmore. Excuse me, General Erdmore. Anyway, General Erdmore tells them that the the Germans have retreated, um, and that there is a company getting ready to advance on them, thinking that the Germans are on the run. But they have some new information that says that the Germans are not on the run. They're doing this on purpose, and they're falling back to a very heavily fortified area. And that the people that are going to be making this advance are basically walking into an ambush, and they're all going to die. It's like 16,000 people or 1,600 people. And that it's up to them, and the reason why they were picked is because Lance Corporal Blake's brother is in this group of, of soldiers that are going to be making this advancement. They need to make it to this this group before they do the advancement, which is going to happen tomorrow morning. And you, you get the sense that this is taking place probably in the late morning um, or yeah. an afternoon time frame of day one, and they've got to make it there by the morning of day two. It's roughly nine miles. Um, they got to do it on foot. And the reason why they have to do this is because all of the the cable lines to relay this message have been severed. Th this conversation is happening maybe minute four, minute five of the movie, which I love. I love that the movie cuts through any of this, you know, backstories and, and you just, yeah. you know what you need to know. These two guys, they're young, they're in the military and they got, they have this mission. They have to do it, period. They immediately leave the audience of the general and Lance Corporal Blake is like, done, let's go. And he <laughs> immediately is marching, yeah. I mean, he's got he's got his family there. I think there's also um, Dean Charles Chapman does a phenomenal job here. And I don't know if it was done intentionally or not, but he's he's his character is almost projecting that. This is so important. This mission is so important to him, n not only because it's his brother, but also because of the importance on the war. Like, I, I didn't get the sense that he was doing this strictly for love of his brother. I got the sense that he was doing this because of 10 different reasons. The, the, the general ass. It's got to be important. It's my brother. It's, you know, it's my duty. It's, it's the war. It's I just, you got this yeah. overwhelming sense of, like, need. He needs to fulfill this mission. That, that ties in really with uh, when he's asking McKay about his, uh, or Schofield, about his um, uh, medal. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's like really digging into him about like where his medal is, why he doesn't have it, like why doesn't he think it's important to send it back home to his family. So like that, yeah, that shows that like he's, he is like in it whatsoever, like, not like indoctrinated, but, um, like all that stuff matters to him. Like, yeah, absolutely. And, you, you get the sense also, that, that, that maybe he also, he's been in some stuff, but not, not nearly as serious as, uh, as Schofield. Yeah, so they so start Schofield moving. definitely comes out as like the more, um, more mature. Seasoned. Yeah, more seasoned. He's he he doesn't want to, like he's ready for action, but he doesn't want to just run in and get himself killed. Whereas Blake yeah. is like, 
let's go. We need to go right now. Yeah. So, I mean, immediately they leave the general's presence and, and Blake is, is, you know, huffing foot through the trenches. He's, he's, you know, moving through crowds the entire time they're going through the trenches. They're, they're literally walking through miles of trenches and Schofield's kind of lagging behind telling him, Hey, calm down. Let's, let's take a break. Let's, I mean, he even says like, let's, let's wait till darkness because they're, they're also Schofield's kind of questioning the Intel. He's saying like, you know, we don't necessarily know. We have to walk through German territory to, to deliver this message. And we don't exactly know what we're walking into. So why don't we wait till darkness and then we go. It's only nine miles. We can do it over, over the night. And Blake's like, no, period. We got to go now. The sooner we get there, the better. And they get to a point in the trenches where they're now, they, they need to go over, they need to go over the top of the berm and through the German territory. And when they get there, the commanding officer has died. The second in command who has now taken over, you know, he reads the I note. Love that guy. <laughs> he he's great because yeah. he he plays a seasoned war vet perfectly. He's got this note from the general that these these two guys are delivering to him saying, "Let me over, you know, I have important duties I need to to do." And he more or less calls the general an idiot. You know, <laughs> they don't they don't know what they're talking about. The Germans were just shooting at us 24 hours ago. We have one easy night and suddenly they think the Germans are retreating. You, yeah. He basically tells the guys, you're going over to certain death. <laughs> when he gives he them the comments flare. at one point. <laughs> he gives him the flare gun and he says, he, well, first he tells him while he's, he's kind of like bringing him over to the area that they're going to go up. He says, if you get injured, stay quiet because we're not going to come get you until nighttime. So essentially you're on your own for a couple hours. Just yeah. shut your mouth so they don't keep shooting at you. Then he hands him a flare gun and he says, we don't have very many of these, so do us a favor and throw it back if you get shot. Like just as you're as you're dying, if you're dying, just throw it over your shoulder. <laughs> Which is so perfect. I mean, the idea yeah. that it's it's comical, but it's also real that that these guys are basically saying, like, we're not so much worried about you dying because that's going to happen. We're more worried about saving saving the people that aren't oh, going to die. That is, and that is that is like real life, like equipment over body, right? Like, just think about all the times where Marines have like, uh, like in Twin End Palms, when that Marine went missing, they left him out as a road guard, and the only reason they even knew that he was missing was because the rifle counts were off. <laughs> which, which, I I don't want to sound insensitive by, by laughing at that or by, by, I, I think the reason why I find it comical is having the experience of being in the military. Yes. You, you get that. I mean, you, you are, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. There, there is a sense of indoctrination and I, and I mean that not in a negative way, but there is yes. a sense that you are, that are, is instilled in you that no one is, is better than the group than the sum, you know, that yeah. while your life is important, your life is not as important as the as the group, as the, the as squad, the as the battalion, as the mission, hundred percent. And I think people understand that. I think I think military or marines specifically, you understand that, and that's why when this guy's telling them like throw the flare gun over your shoulder if you get <laughs> shot, they don't they don't like take offense to it. They're like, okay, yeah, we yeah. get it. Like, of course. Go ahead. Oh, I just got to say one thing though. Um, okay, so it's Lieutenant Gordon, right, that they come up on. Um, like, one of the parts of the, this is one of the parts of the movie that just got me. Like, I was cracking up. When he walks past, and he was like, Kilgore, wake up. You waste of space. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's it's a like, great scene. Yes. Like, that right there kind of, so, like, sums up a lot of my career so far. <laughs> like, you like you have all those guys there, but you're always like Kilgore is always the one that's catching your eye. You always you always got to be on that guy because if you for, if you let off him for one second, like he's gonna do something stupid. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There is always one. There's always one. In fact, there's like I don't know if it's still a thing because I'm so I'm so out. I got out in 2009, 
So it's yeah. it's been a while for me, but um, there was an ongoing thing like don't don't be the one. There's always yeah. one. Oh, don't let saying. that be you. Yes. So I want to talk about the next scene because this is really I think where where the audience gets the sense of importance and a sense of dread in this movie. They go over the berm yeah. and they are walking through no man's land and no man's land is the space between two opposing forces. It's the, it's the area in this particular circumstance. It's the area between the German lines and the British lines. No man's land is usually muddy, nasty barbed wire and, and dead bodies. Um, it is, a very harsh area and it's where you go during combat and these two go over the berm and they have to walk through no man's land in order to get over to the German side so that they can continue on through the German side and to where they need to go eventually. But the camera follows them through no man's land as they essentially tiptoe through and it's such a graphic process can you talk to me about about your viewing of it and what your thoughts were okay so first of all back to lieutenant gordon did a great job of of guiding them through like giving them the talk on like hey you're gonna this is where you need to go this is what you're gonna see this is what you're gonna smell like that's great officership right there so absolutely because he even to, tells them he Gordon. tells them where the where the brakes are and the barbed wire yeah. and and what key i mean because you have to figure you're not telling them you'll know, go down north street hang a right at the corner yeah. it's he, he he tells him there's a break in the barbed wire by the praying man and then you you see yeah. as they walk through that there is a, a body hanging in the barbed wire and it looks yeah. like he's praying yeah. and it's just it's very surreal but keep going yeah. So then you just you you think like as they're going through this, right? They're all the craters, all the mud. Like they're just getting covered in mud, right? They're slipping everywhere. There's dead things. Like there's one horse that's like completely bloated, and and then there's another horse that's like skeleton is is exposed. So it's like that one's been dead for a long time. And you just got to think like the thing that comes to my mind is. As, you're, as they're going through that, is how would I move, like, as myself as an officer, like, how would I have moved my platoon through that space? Like, that's real, that's crazy to think about. Like, if you just had all your guys online and then they have to run through that while they're getting shot at, like, I'm up, they yeah, see yeah. me, I'm down, set. <laughs> like, <laughs> buddy rushing through that, like, that just that the the just thinking about that the feeling that that gives me you just have to think i would do it and, you know it's orders i would do it but yeah. like that's that's crazy like yeah that that it's, space it's, there is no man's land is a good name for it because no man should be there. <laughs> it's a pretty it's a pretty crazy thing and and again this is all being shot as one continuous shot, or it's, it's being portrayed to you as one continuous shot. They, I, I watched tons of behind the scenes footage on this, and they, in order to get over some of this terrain, they would have scenes where they would film with somebody holding the camera, and then that person, as they went, would be passing the camera off either to somebody else or attaching it to a crane, or in some cases, putting it in the back of a vehicle. Then the crane or vehicle would move for a distance and then stop. And then somebody would take it off of the vehicle and keep going. And so some of these shots are eight to 10 minutes long and the camera is transitioning between two or three people or vehicles or whatever. Yeah. And, and it's, it's seamless. You really, you don't notice it at all. Mm -hmm. The director said several times that he took a, a lot of comedy in, in reading some of these you know, recaps from people who would say, oh, I spotted a cut there, or I spotted it. And he's like, they were they were picking up things where there wasn't cuts. They were telling me places where there was cuts, that they, they knew there wasn't one. He want, wanted to know how I shot that. And it is, it is so seamless. There's really only two distinct moments in the movie, and, and I'll I'll talk about them when we get there, that you can you can tell that there is a break in in the film there. Um but yeah, this is this is very this whole scene 
is very anxiety ridden because yes. you don't you don't know what they're walking into. You're seeing just a wasteland that they're walking through. They get to the German. Um, oh, hold on, uh, hold on. Oh, go ahead. Before we go there. We got to talk about. So oh, I know, I know what you're gonna say. This is so gross. <laughs> Schofield is holding, holding some barbed wire out of the way, using his hand, which. I don't know why. I guess, like, in the moment, maybe you think that's the best idea. Like, you have a whole rifle to do that. I was so just he's holding... We should... <laughs> <laughs> he's holding up his hand. And then, of course, like, and this just shows, like, the relationship between him and Blake. Like, Blake moves through, right? And he's, it's just, like, his character. Like, you know, he's got, like, the wrist, the, uh, like, the, uh, bracelet. the silver bracelet on it. He's got two rings on, like, he's he's this character that's like so in like so about being in the military but also like there's still this piece of individualism in him and then he's just and then you can tell his brain is just not on the same level as Sheffield. so he moves through bumps the the barbed wire and it pulls it the the bar out of Sheffield's hand so now he's just holding the barbed wire in his hand so his hand gets all cut up so now he's like, hands fucked up, got to move through. He gets down into a, <laughs> and then Blake again, so he gets down into a crater and then Blake just plops his body in and forces Schofield to put his hand down inside of a dead body. The hand that just got cut open inside. Uh, a, not, not only am I cringing from, from watching this, but I am immediately thinking, He's getting his hand cut off. Like he's it's yes. infected, and yes. he's, he just cut it off. Might as well just cut it off at this point. He wraps it in like bandages, which in the night are just muddy and nasty. It, it's yeah. horrifying. Uh, yeah. So they they manage to make it through Dead Man's or excuse me, No Man's Land. They get over to the German trenches, and they find them emptied. And they get to a point where um, it, it's it's you find out previously that Blake is very good with directions. So he yeah. knows where he's, he's got to go. They're in the German trenches. They get to where they need to. They need to kind of move forward, and the trenches are blocked. And the only way they can really go is through this kind of underground tunnel, which they find out while moving into the tunnel that it's essentially a barracks. It's it's a yeah. um, a dwelling for soldiers. It's all emptied, minus a couple cans of of nothing and some empty bunks. Dog food. And yeah, dog food. Um, they see a massive rat, um, which is another thing you got to think. These these trenches are not only going to be muddy and nasty that you're living in for months, but they've also got to be rat infested and just horrifying. But anyway, while while being slightly distracted by the rat, they Showfield sees a tripwire, which at this point when he finds a tripwire. I, two things immediately come to mind, and this scene is shot so well because the, the tripwire could be a trope that they tiptoe around and try to maneuver through. Like th- that could have been really drawn out, um, yeah. you know, as they walk through the German um, uh, bunkers and stuff like that. But instead, you get about four seconds between <laughs> tripwire being found and massive explosion. When they find yes. in, in that four seconds, two things enter my head. Number one, why were they not looking for tripwires previously? Because that that would be the like I, I'm immediately going to think the place is booby trapped. But two, your anxiety goes through the roof because this rat is running around on the ground where he's identified the tripwire is. But before you can even even react to the rat, the explosion happens, and it happens almost right next to Showfield. Blake manages to remain conscious finds Schofield in the debris and is quickly trying to get him up and get him moving so they can make their way out of this, this trench and out into the open. Um, it, it's just, it's such a claustrophobic scene. Yeah. Schofield can't see because of all the dust in his eyes. You get, have you ever do the cinnamon challenge? No. So there was this thing, this this was back when I was in high school, so probably long before you, but there was this thing where it's it's impossible for you to eat a, a tablespoon of cinnamon. And for the listeners, yeah. I am not condoning doing this. Do not do it because 
when, when this was a when this was a thing, <laughs> this, I'm such an idiot. When this was a thing in high school, I immediately thought a tablespoon of cinnamon. I could eat, easily eat that. And when you go to do it, the cinnamon, when you swallow it, the cinnamon immediately coats your entire throat and you can't breathe and you can get seriously injured. But I luckily didn't. I spent, you know, 10 minutes coughing up cinnamon until I can catch my breath. <laughs> but the reason why I bring that up is because that's that's immediately where my mind went when you see Schofield, because yeah. he gets up, and he starts moving. He can't see. And he's just like gagging on on dust and, and debris and, and rock. And it's just it's. You really feel for him. It's it's bad. It's really bad. They get they get to like a, a part where they've got to jump over this like <laughs> hole or whatever, and Schofield can't see. It, and Blake's like, "You just gotta trust me. Just just jump." Yeah. They yeah, they get was, out. That was an anxiety written scene for sure. Like I'm just like that scene right there is one of the scenes in this movie that definitely like to me cemented it as like a very good movie. Like I felt like I was scared. Yeah, like, absolutely. Obviously, you know he's going to make it through it because there has to be the rest of the movie. But like at that time, you're not thinking about that at all. You're like, oh my god, like get out of this. So it's it's funny that you say that because w- the first time I watched this, I thought Schofield was dead because the explosion happened so close to him. I'm like, he's dead. There's no way he's not dead. Then Blake digs him out, and they make it out of the bunker, out into the sunshine. Um, and I was like, oh. Yeah, I guess in retrospect, of course he doesn't die. You know, he's a main character. DFAT Comics is the publishing branch of Don'tForgetATowel.com, the only place to travel geekly. Focusing on creator-owned and independent titles like Hollowed, Pursuit of Plastic, and Fairy, and many more. DFAT Comics will be a mix of genres appealing to every kind of reader. Join the new source of comic book entertainment, with DFAT Comics. They clean themselves up. They continue to move on out of the trenches. And now they're behind what was at one point the, the German enemy line. They walk through the woods a little bit. They have a very interesting conversation where Blake tells a story about another guy. And oh, did, did he tell you how he lost his ear? Yeah. He's a, he's a showboat. He, he makes things up. But the real reason, the real you know way he lost his ear is he was complaining to his girlfriend, who's a hairdresser, about how shitty the conditions were here. So she sent him some real foo-foo, you know, hair care product that smells like, what did you say, peanut butter, I think? A uh, honey. Honey, that's what it was. It smells like honey. So he's, he lathers his hair all up with it at night because he doesn't want to wear it in front of his, his boys. Laz, lathers his hair up at night with it. Oh, it's because he middle. didn't want to carry it in his pack. Oh, is that why? Yeah, yeah, which I can, which I could definitely, <laughs> definitely relate to. You just like, I don't, fuck, I don't want to carry this. Like, <laughs> any ounce, like, what's it? The saying is, uh, ounces equals pounds, pounds equal pain, or something like that. <laughs> like, it just starts at, like starts that. at the low, the lowest level. It's like, no matter how small something, like every little ounce adds up to a pound and a pound adds up to pain. <laughs> Absolutely. To <laughs> Absolutely. And then you just prolong it over miles of walking. It's, just, it's awful. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he wakes up in the middle of the night and a rat is eating or is licking his, this, this honey shit out of his hair. The rat freaks him out. So he, you know, screams or moves or whatever, scares the rat and the rat bites his ear off. Yeah. Which I thought this is, this is a great story. It it takes you for a moment out of what is happening to them. I mean, this is moments after one of them almost died. And you get this sense that they are still focused on the mission. That it is still, what has just happened to them is no sweat off their brow. And they're going to continue to march on. Is, is yeah, kind of so what I got out of that. Yeah, that's Blake. Because Schofield, bef- uh, right before that, Schofield's like, why'd you pick me? Like he's pissed. He's like, I don't. Why am I here? And Blake's like, Hey, man, I thought it was gonna be something easy. Like I thought they were gonna send us to get food or something. Like I didn't know it was gonna be this. And so yeah. obviously, Schofield, having just been an inch away from death, is just pissed off. So Blake tells a story that completely like changes the mood, like releases the tension that's there from what just happened. And that's like, that's like a real thing. Um, like. 
you're going through like the worst stuff. Like you're sitting, you're sitting out in the field. It's raining, pouring rain for days. Like you're sitting in a hole. You're all muddy and cold, and like, like you're starting to go internal. Like you're starting to go with the, in the black, as they call it. And like someone just can bring up a funny story, like anything, to make you just chuckle for a little bit, and like that just brings you out of it, brings you back. Um, you know, into the moment, in with the boys, like, you know, it's not so bad, we're together, like, because that's, like, the worst thing, once you start to go into yourself, like, go internal, um, then you just become miserable, miserable, and it makes every, every situation, like, that much worse, but, like, that's where the camaraderie comes in, so that's what Blake was doing there, was, um, you know, lighten the mood, lighten the tension, like, you know, that guy lost his ear. That's funny. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm ready. It's, now it's, I'm ready to keep going. It's funny that you say that because I was just thinking the same thing is that, you know, a lot of times being in the military and talking about this type of stuff to civilians, you oftentimes talk about the, the camaraderie and how you're, you're fighting for your, the guy next to you, not really the overall war and how there is such a bond, you know, with people in the military and, you know, we, we joke around between branches, but even the military as a whole has a bond. And I think individual branches have their own bond, too. I mean, I, I see another Marine oftentimes out in the streets. You know, I have a Marine Corps T-shirt on or something like that. And I get, you know, thank you for your service, your ura or, you know, Semper Fi or something like that. And that's that's where that comes from. You know, that's where that camaraderie comes from is because, like you said, you're you have a shared experience, even if you weren't next to each other. You know, at the time, you have a shared experience of this dark thing that you faced and the camaraderie that came out of it. And I think that that's so shared in the military that you don't necessarily have to be in the foxhole with the guy to know we both had that thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, Even more so with Marines, because all of us go through, like, infantry training yeah, the crucible. I mean, it, it's it's the the end all test at the end of boot camp. And and for those of you who are interested in knowing more about this, I highly recommend a documentary called Ears Open, Eyeballs Click. It's probably one mm. of the best documentaries made about Marine Corps boot camp, and will show you kind of what that is and why you know if you have a loved one that has been through that or is going to go through that, why three months can completely change who a person is. Um, but so moving on, they, they go through the woods, they have this conversation, they come out on the other side, there's an open field and on the other side of the field is a farmhouse. The farmhouse looks pretty well destroyed, although there all are still four walls and a roof. All the windows are broken out. The, the inside is completely emptied. They have to go clear the farmhouse in order to move on. In there's doing dog. so, yeah, there's a dead dog, which is sad. Um, dogs are cool. Um, in, in doing so. They come out the back of the farmhouse and they notice that in the air there is a dogfight happening. Uh, dogfight is the term used for World War One, World War Two, air to air combat. Now you have to imagine these are not F eighteen fighter jets; these are biplanes. These are you know twin twin pl- um, uh, winged planes. A lot of times, specifically during World War One, they don't have missiles or you know gas they can release on the people below them. They oftentimes would just take a crate full of grenades into the plane with them. They would fly over enemy territory, pull the pin, and drop the grenade. But in some cases, um, like the case that we're watching in the movie, these uh, biplanes did have you know mounted machine guns. Or at very, you know, very least, they would carry their own rifle and be able to shoot um, while flying. So you have two British aircrafts chasing a German aircraft, and they're having this this dogfight. And the two guys stop for a brief second to watch this. And they see that one of the British planes manages to shoot down the German aircraft. And the German aircraft decides that it's going to land right where they're standing. And there's this awesome scene of the <laughs> aircraft landing. And it kind of like slides along the ground. And, and Schofield's got to like run out of the way. Or, or Blake's got to run out of the way. The plane lands. It's on fire. And I want to ask you, what do you do? You're in the situation and that happens. 
You're, you're the you're you're so, in Blake's shoes, and that happens. What do you do? So first of all, uh, when the plane is crashing, they run away from the plane, but like straight. So they're still in the direction <laughs> of the plane's movement, <laughs> and they run, and so they barely just miss like getting hit by this thing because instead of going perpendicular to its movement. They go <laughs> Um, but I guess at the time it's probably hard to think that because it goes down under the the side of the hill and they're like, oh, that was cool. And then all of a sudden it comes up and it's going to run at them. But so the plane lands, it's on fire. They can hear the German guy uh, inside of it. Um, now this like shows and, and I, this happens, I guess, uh, this kind of concept I think happens a couple times in the movie and just like lets you know. Kind of gives you a sense of the differences in the sides, the British and the Huns, as they call them. So I would have shot this dude in the head while he was still burning in the plane. Like, I would have straight up just shot him in the head. Like, I, I'll help you. I will help you by not letting you burn to death. That, that is my help to you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's funny that you say that because so what Blake does is Blake pulls the guy out of the plane and mm -hmm. gets him to the middle of the field in between where the plane is crashed and the and the house. And the the guy's obviously in pain. He was on just recently on fire. He tells Schofield, go grab him some water. And there's there's like a little well um just up up you know the area there in the backyard. Um, Schofield runs over, starts pumping some water into his helmet and here's the commotion. Now, again, you're, this is all one shot from the beginning of the movie. You're fixated on Schofield. You hear the commotion as well. Schofield turns and as Schofield runs back, um, he fires and kills the German, but it's too late. The German has stabbed Blake in the stomach. I I'm thinking at this point, this Blake is going to be injured the rest of this movie the chauffeur is going to have to carry him or drag him or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, but, but that, yeah, that doesn't happen. Instead, Blake dies. Blake is and such a bitch. <laughs> this, this fucking bitch dies. <laughs> and he, this, this is a, this is a great scene because you actually see like, so Blake, <clears throat> Blake is dying. Schofield is holding him. And at one point, Blake says, I'm I'm dying, aren't I? And Schofield yeah. says yes. And Blake kind of has this moment where there is so much blood coming out of him. He is losing color very quickly. He turns oh, like a grayish God. blue. Yeah. And he like he like I don't want to say blackouts, but he he looks at Schofield and he says, "What was I shot?" Yeah. And Schofield says, yeah. "No, you were stabbed." Like in in just in just like a two minute period, Blake has already lost so much blood that he's becoming delusional, and he eventually yeah. fades off and and dies. Um, completely threw me for a loop because I thought for sure both of our main characters are going to make it the whole way. And, <laughs> and the, the previews. Uh, did you know this already? No, I know. When I first watched it, I had no idea um, that Blake died. But when he did die, I was I was comforted. I honestly didn't like the character not in a way <laughs> not in a way that he was portrayed badly but uh in a way that like when he died i was like okay at least it'll go a lot smoother now <laughs> like not not <laughs> everyone gets not, not everyone gets to make it you know so, right. <laughs> and if, <laughs> and if someone's not this gonna make the, it this isn't your pep talk pre-battle is it like listen not everyone's <laughs> gonna make it all right this is so no, you, you know what's it's, it's really funny, right? So, I went in as an as a uh, an infantry officer. Okay, so you go to um, TBS, the basic school in Quantico, Virginia, and while you're at TBS, and like when you get to TBS outside, when you get you you pass officer candidate school, you go to TBS. Like probably eighty percent of all the guys that make it through are like, "I'm going infantry." Yes. Bah. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> right like everyone's so like i'm going over to yeah. yeah then you get to tbs and while you're in your tbs class you see the ioc class going through the entry officer course 
guys because it's like right across the street so like you're going through uh tbs like the regular basic officer course so one thing that's way that's different about the marine corps and what i like love about the marine corps even though it sucks most of the time is that <laughs> no matter no matter if you're gonna be like a, a true marine <laughs> no matter if you're going to be a pilot if you're going to be a lawyer if you're going to be an infantryman if you're going to be a uh whatever you all go through the same course that is infantry focused so everyone is supposed to be able to be a a, a provisional uh rifle platoon commander now in other services like take like the navy you go in as an officer you go to the naval academy like you go to school and then you just go and you're like put in front of the marine in front of your uh your sailors like so there's a huge difference between like a naval um lieutenant well not a lieutenant because that's a captain but a naval uh ensign or a lieutenant junior grade and a marine corps second lieutenant first lieutenant because they actually have leadership like training like they've been put in front of their peers and been forced to lead them uh in infantry scenarios like digging in like so everyone does all this right but while you're there at tbs you see the ioc class and you see these guys and they all look like the guys that are in the trenches. Like, and this is like, <laughs> you, like you're happy, you're getting weekends off, you're like, <laughs> you know, stuff isn't going so bad. But you see these guys that are just like, every time you see them, like you rarely see them, but every time you do see them, they look like a dead Blake. Like their faces <laughs> are sunken in. They're like, <laughs> they're, they're just no, you look in their eyes and they have like a thousand yard stare. Like their, their eyes are blank. Right. And then you go through the first, uh, the first couple field exercises. And then after the first exercise, you probably have like 70% that want to be infantry now. You go through the second one and then you're down to 15% that want to be. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then yeah. they hear all this. They hear all the stories of the things that happen in IOC because IOC is like a very, um, like you go, you don't talk about IOC. IOC is the fight club of, <laughs> of right? So no, no joke. It's the, and literally it is the fight club of the Marine Corps because all you do is fight each other. <laughs> but like you hear all these stories, you don't know what's true. You don't know what's uh, fabricated or whatever. Um, so like, but so but like all marines though all officers in the marine corps at least have a taste of what it's like to be like an infantryman where you don't have that in other branches yeah well well said well said i mean you're always taught you're a rifleman first the idea yeah. is that it doesn't matter what your mos is um if you got to pick up a weapon and fire it you're going to do it proficiently and uh yeah i mean the marine corps gets a lot of respect for that reason so so blake dies yeah, Blake dies moments after he saved um, uh, Schofield's life. Yeah. The the Germans dead, and Schofield manages to kind of he's 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 approached by two other British officers or, or British um, soldiers or or whatever okay. who get him up, get him moving. Um, they move. He moves Blake over by the building. Takes uh, I think the the. Orders from the ger- um, the general that they, they got to deliver. His rings. Yeah, takes his rings, takes uh, his dog tag, and immediately is approached by another group. They have a couple vehicles, and they're heading kind of in the same direction. So they say, you know, hop in. We'll carry you as far as we can. This is really, this is where the movie, to me, goes from... And and spoilers to the end of the podcast where we talk about whether or not we like this movie or whether it's a good movie. But this is where the movie goes from amazing to like pretty good. Like it takes a, a step down for me at this point because they drive for a little while. The vehicle gets stuck. All the guys hop out. They get the vehicle unstuck. Well, hold on, hold on. Let's not. We gotta we gotta talk about Mark Strong here. Okay, go ahead. Not, not, not Mark Strong. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me look at my notes real quick. Chem Smith. Yeah, yeah, Mark Strong. Okay, so he comes in. Um, all right, so when they're in the back of the truck, I actually really enjoyed this part. 
Okay, interesting. Well, first of all, first of all, Captain Smith comes along, who's Mark Strong, right? Who is, um, you know, this guy's in. He's a bad guy in Sherlock Holmes. Uh, is he a bad guy in Kick Ass? Think. Um, he. I don't think he is. No, he's a bad guy in Shazam. Probably, probably most recently, yeah. bad guy in Shazam. He's been in a ton of stuff. He's got a very. Yeah. Very memorable face, very forgettable name. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When I saw him, I was like, oh, shit, I know that guy. And then I had to look him <laughs> up. But, uh, okay, so he comes in. He, he, um, he's like, hey, what do you got going on? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, come with us. We, we're trying to get up this way. Now, he talks to, and so this is the first time in the movie. And when I, before I, the time between when I watched it the first time and when I watched it the second time, um, there was a theme that I thought this movie had way more of than I realized when I thought about it the second time when I was watching it of like this Hollywood concept that like officers are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> the, so like, most... I, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of officers in the movies are portrayed as being young. The, the, the idea is, is that a lot of the officers that you see in movies are first lieutenant, second lieutenant, fresh out of school. They're green. They don't know shit. They show up and they're immediately put above the staff sergeant Gunny, who's been out there for 20 years and, you know, has dirt under his fingernails. So they try to portray the officer as being dumber than shit as compared to this enlisted guy who's been, who's been doing it. Yeah. And then also you have like the, which I couldn't agree with field grade officers. They ah, <laughs> but they, and they also show the field grade officers who are like, "I am royalty, and you are all peasants." <laughs> so like, they're, they're, those are the two ways that officers are usually portrayed in movies in Hollywood. Now, what I want to bring here, so Mark Strong actually, he the officer that he plays in this movie, um, definitely you can tell is a good officer. Mm -hmm. um, but like the, the, I think the major or whatever that's over him that he speaks to for like a second um in the car so he's the yeah. guy that they're making that they're all making fun of in the back of the truck so like i know that all have like that stuff happens they're sitting in the back of the truck they're all impersonating this officer right the um the the major or whatever the commanding officer they're like they have like his voice and accent mm -hmm. and everything and mannerisms all down and that's like that's definitely because even even like uh as a lieutenant we had that for our commanding officers for sure. Right. We like in when we're in a room together, we call them by their first names. <laughs> you know, and like we do impersonations of them. And like all the Marines do that for us and them as well. And usually the Marines are, are way better at it. Um, but obviously that guy is is like everyone hates him. Like he's right. like they tell the story about how uh, a guy comes out of the latrine and just wipes shit all over his back. <laughs> But like that, so I think that's why I had the idea in my head that this movie had so many like bad officers in it. But I think after watching it the second time and thinking about it, I think there's only really two that are like, um, like that guy sucks. But so, it does so make the, it not, not Captain Smith, but the other guy you're saying is yeah, one of them, the major yeah, or whatever. Yeah, the Marines are in the back. They're they're making fun of them. They're like, uh, and then they have the the Sherpa back there. So like, they got a little uh, joint forces action going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but like that trip with them in the back, I think um, it was almost. I wouldn't say that it takes away from the movie. Like it's almost like a short break, mm -hmm. and 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 it lightens the mood. There's some comedy there. Uh, Cause they're telling the story about the guy and then it shows like the, them interacting with him. Like once they find out like what his mission is and like what, um, what he's trying to do and the way they handle that, like, they're like, wow, the one guy's like, wow, you're not going to make it. And so he has to turn and be like, Oh, I'm going to make it. Right. And then the rest of the guys like see his determination. Um, when the vehicle gets stuck, that is a that is a quintessential military moment right there. 
So this guy's like, I need to go. Let's push this thing. And there's a couple guys that are like, okay, let's push it. And then the rest of them know. So you have like five guys pushing this truck. And then there's like 20 guys standing out there, just standing there like, oh, we're stuck again. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, keep it's, it on it's, the road. It's, it's funny because you make the comment that, you know, their their conversation lightens the mood. And it does for everyone but Schofield. I mean, you you get the sense that he is still. I mean, this is moments after his friend died in his arms, yeah. and yeah. these guys are joking around. Now they're joking around because they don't know what just took place, and yeah. they're laughing and they're having a good time and they're impersonating the officer. But when they get stuck in the mud, Schofield hops out and he's like, "We we've got to push, we've got to move," and yeah. the rest of them are like, "Yeah, okay, you know, we'll get out of this." Yeah, eventually and he has this moment of like, yeah, he has this moment of like almost looking them dead in the eyes and saying, no, this, this is important. I need to get where I'm going or people are going to die and you need to help. I mean, like he, he, he literally pulls them back into reality that this isn't funny. It's not a joke. We need yes. to move. And, yes. and you get this sense that even though they were joking and it was lightening the mood, it wasn't for him. Yeah. Yeah. No. So that's like uh, something that I've dealt with quite a bit. Right, like, um, obviously not in a in a combat situation. And most Marines nowadays that are uh, sergeants are below have not seen combat. Now, a lot of the ones that are uh, staff sergeant above, they've been to Iraq, they've been uh, to Afghanistan. But uh, even now, though, those guys and their experiences are not. I don't want to say not relevant, um, but they're not what we're training for now. Like we're not right. like we're we're not training to fight uh, asymmetric war so much anymore. We're like training for a peer near peer threat, someone that has everything that we have and more actually, like and probably definitely more. So we're actually outgunned um, and outmanned in the next coming fights as we are set up right now. Um, so my job, um, and this is a tangent, this is definitely just- No, no you're fine, keep going. Um, but but like, go, kind of circling back on that, like officers look bad in movies. Um, if the movie is from the perspective of a uh, enlisted person, it's always gonna look like that, I think, because, um, our role is to kind of move to the next step. Um, and that doesn't sit well with a lot of people that came through Iraq and Afghanistan. Like that's the fight they know, but they're not prepared for the fight that's coming up. Um, right. Yeah. So to like bring it back to the movie, um, actually I lost my place. <laughs> so they, they, they get their vehicle unstuck. They keep going. Yeah. They get to a point where they come up to a bridge that has been wiped out. And yeah. uh, Captain Smith hops off and basically says, listen, we're going right. Schofield is like, I can't go around. I need to go across. You know, yeah. just leave me here and I'll, I'll make my way. So he hops off. He attempts to kind of go across this bridge um, on on foot. It, the, the bridge is maybe 50 yards but yeah. he on the way across, he takes on some gunfire, manages. So this is this is where I think the movie starts really kind of making me angry. Every person, because <laughs> so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of fast forward the next section because the next section involves he takes some fire from a sniper, he kills the sniper, takes a shot himself, which knocks him out. He wakes up at nighttime and essentially has to go through this abandoned city encountering several Germans along the way. My yeah. issue with this this whole train of scenes here is that every German he encounters is a stormtrooper from Star Wars who can't shoot <laughs> worth of shit. And it's it's just it's one idiot after another. Now, I I understand the occasional stray bullet in this movie. But up until this point, I'm thinking the movie is highly accurate and I feel really in the middle of this war that's happening. 
Yeah. But he 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 gets shot at probably about five times by a sniper. All five. Yeah, that's shots. Still, I was like, wow, that sniper sucks. That sniper sucks. <laughs> He takes a bullet and knocks himself out. And like I'd mentioned earlier, this is the first time right. in the movie where you have a definitive cut because he knocks himself out and wakes up at nighttime. Yes. So there is a break in the movie here. Don't forget he, that he shoots. He shoots seven rounds at the sniper. The sniper who had a clear open shot of him trying to walk across, right. trying to tiptoe uh, across the top of a bridge, misses him, and he hits the sniper from the ground. To put mm-hmm. him in the position that he's in once he gets up to him. Right. So, so that, that was that I, bothered. That was, that was, yeah. <laughs> I had reservations. He wakes up. Well. He wakes up at night and goes through this city. He has this encounter with a a, a person, a, a female, and a baby who's hiding. Again, I thought all of that was throwaway. I could have done without that. Um, he yeah, encounters two more. He encounters two more Germans yeah. who are, I, I'm assuming at least one of them was drunk. I think they're both drunk, yeah. Okay, so they're in the middle of a war zone and drinking to the point of intoxication. I I understand you're, you're invading a full city, you come across some wine, you might take a few sips. And I also understand taking that wine or brandy or whatever back to the foxhole or the trenches or behind the line and getting shit face off of it. They are they are by themselves because remember the Germans have retreated at this point. So you have probably a small battalion of of Germans in the middle of a city that they are anticipating the British coming to in order to follow them on their so-called retreat and they're drinking they're drinking to the point of so, excess they get go ahead i don't think that i, I, I you uh, your tone makes it sound like you don't think that would actually happen i but, i think that if it were to happen they deserve to be shot like they were yeah yes so i think that it, that's definitely a realistic scene uh, I think that would t- absolutely happen. If I if I went out with some of my Marines, you know, that, <laughs> that I had in my life, and they came across, um, you know, came across some some drink while we were doing something, and I left them be for, you know, a few hours, I I definitely would come back to, to few, those uh, motherfuckers. Twenty me. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. okay, so let's let's. Let's glance over that then. I, I'm willing to accept the fact that them being drunk is not, you know, out of the ordinary. He kills one, one of them. About that scene. So I was counting. So back to the, the the round count. I was counting. And so he shot the pilot twice. Okay, that's right. Yeah. So I'm going to give the movie the benefit of the doubt that he reloaded sometime when we didn't see him. Sure. But. When it comes to movies, if you don't see it on screen, does it really happen? <laughs> then True. he shoots at the sniper to kill him seven times. So I know those guns only have held like seven or eight rounds. But so I was yeah. I was looking so I was looking into it and I was like, wow, they really fucked this up, didn't they? But if you give them the benefit of the doubt that he reloaded. After killing the, because I I now bring this up because I saw it in like a review somewhere um, that he reloaded after he killed the pilot. They actually were pretty accurate because after he killed the sniper, he didn't shoot again. Like at all? That's I mean, great because yeah. he kills it, he kills the one German in hand to hand combat. The Hollywood choke, yeah, with the Hollywood yeah. choke, and then he doesn't shoot again. So. At first, I was kind of knocking the movie for that, and then after, like, I really watched it, I was like, "You got it. You can give a movie a benefit of the doubt at least, you know, one or two times." So I'll give them it there. They so he had, they were actually pretty accurate on that point because he never shoots again after that. So it's it's funny you bring that up because it has been a topic of conversation on on several episodes as to how much slack do you give a movie, and from what I've found in the people I've talked to. That needle kind of moves, and it largely depends on how realistic the movie attempts to be. So you have a movie like, for example, 
Little Giants, which we recently covered last season. And you give the movie a lot of slack because you're talking about kids and, you know, uh, peewee football and, you know, the the what could and could not happen sways pretty heavily. But in a movie like this that's so grounded in reality and, and war, um, you tend to give the movie a lot less slack because of their attempt to be serious and be, you know, as straight as they can. So it's funny that you bring that up. So he, he kills one German, he pushes past the second one, and attempts to basically just run out of the city. Uh, in doing so, the German chases him and, and fires several shots at him. Now, not only does the German miss every time, but the German is following him in more or less a straight line, which again pisses me off that not one shot we couldn't get like a like struck struck in the arm or something like we couldn't get anything so with so this is uh this brings up uh something that i said earlier on this part with the guy that he killed first so that guy right he he has him up against the wall and um the guy doesn't know that he doesn't have any ammo or anything and he he basically gives him an opportunity to live. He says, be quiet. Mm-hmm. Right, just be quiet. And he takes his hand off his face. And of course the guy yells. Right? So that shows the difference between the British and the and the, the Germans, right? Like the Germans are there to to kill everybody and kill everything. And the British, like so it shows like the difference in the sides. Like who's the who who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? Well, who's the aggressor? I guess you're gonna right? say, yeah, like the, the that guy, he's like, obviously, this guy could have just killed you, right? So, like, I'm giving you a chance to live, and he doesn't give a fuck. He's like, American or English or whatever he says. Yeah, like, you know, like, come. And then he tries to take out his knife and, and kill him. So, like, they are absolutely the aggressors, and the British are, like, a lot of them still kind of have, like, hold on to a humanity that's, like, I don't want to kill you if i don't have to where the germans are like i'm gonna kill you (laughs) Um, yeah it's funny i i didn't i didn't i didn't get that but now that you mention it yeah i mean between that and between blake pulling him out of the plane earlier on um yeah i think i think that's definitely i wonder if that was done on purpose uh, i think it was i think it was because there was a and when they were in the barracks they come mm-hmm. across like they're in there and they're like, oh, guys lived in here. And then there's a picture of the guy's uh, family. And it kind of like it's almost like they attempt to humanize them. And then they quickly just like kind of take it away in two different uh, aspects where like um, I think it, I think they purposely tried to show them like they there's I can think of no reason why they would have saved that guy. Yeah. The German, like he was literally fighting their, you know, their brothers in arms in the air. Yeah. But like that's the humanity in them that they're like, he's a person and he's hurting. Like I need to save him. And then what does he do? He kills Blake. Yeah, he <laughs> kills what, Blake. Like here's this guy. Like I caught you by surprise. I could kill you right now, but I'm not going to be quiet. And then what does he do? Pulls out his knife, calls for a friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I, I didn't even I didn't even pick up on that. That was well said. So, Sh- Schofield runs out of the city. German yeah. gives chase. Uh, he manages to make a, a last ditch oh. jump into the river. I'll say one more thing on the fact that he did not sh- land any shots. I think movies make uh, shooting a gun while running and doing all sorts of different stuff and wearing all sorts of gear like they make it look easy but it's not at all uh, especially you're, you're like okay you're a pizza box aren't you come on no i'm not the, I'm a, they are I'm running a double, i'm a double they are expert. running in a straight line the german <laughs> is what maybe a hundred yards behind him so, and they have so, a rifle I'm I'm a double expert. Okay, I did shoot sharpshooter rifle one time. Okay, I'm yeah, but I fixed it. I fixed it. Okay, <laughs> but the combat like doing it. So I went to New Zealand um, and did some training with those guys. Now, mind you, I did the shoot like just 
off the street basically just showed up one day and they're like hey like come do this and the and like the other marines had been working on it for the whole week um but it was a combat shoot they didn't do like table one um like we do right Mm -hmm. that and we've actually changed ours so i'm i'm interested to see what this new uh the new um rifle training is going to be but they basically just do a table two but that's like elongated and you start like you start up close for the prequel and it's all in kit like you are moving like the whole time and you go back and then to the actual call you move forward um and i did pretty fucking bad <laughs> like <laughs> i <laughs> like you have to like when you're running and then you get in a position and shoot and then like you get back up run and like that stuff is not easy so um i think that it's very very plausible that those guys while like while chasing someone and trying to shoot at them even in a straight line and I, when i was shooting you know it was with an rco like with an optic and like you know obviously the weapon wasn't really uh um zero to me because i use someone else's rifle like i literally they're like hey come tomorrow and then shoot and i was like you know, anytime you get to pull the trigger, it's a fun time. Absolutely. But yeah. like, <laughs> you're talking about you're talking about like an uh, 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 an M14 or a um, uh, what's the German weapon? Um, I can't think of the name right now. But like, you're talking about a wooden rifle with an iron sight, like, and they're running, See, and, and is, then they're this shooting is, this thing. This is like, going to be the difference between old school and new school Marine. I grew up on iron sights, man. Like like Bane and Dark Knight, I was raised by them. I didn't get a scope until you know. I mean, like iron sights are where where my bread and butter are. I didn't get a scope until I was nearly a man. No. <laughs> but so I, what, here's what I will say though. I will say this: if you're if you're conceding the fact that the German was drunk, which I was not, I was saying I'm like he's there's no way he's drunk. He's in combat. But if you're saying that he, he's drunk. Then that that makes it a world difference. But the other thing yeah, is the German shot shooting. what like seven or eight times. I actually didn't count their shots because there was two of them. Okay. Eventually, there was two of them that were chasing him. I did not count their shots, but just thinking like, hey, they got this city; they're burning it to the ground. Um, you know, they're like they think that they they think they're like gods. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like they're you can you get the sense from them that um you know at this point they think like they're the greatest military on earth and you know yeah i mean big. at this point they're winning so, like, until they, the americans showed up they were winning the war um, yeah so so the, the other the other great thing that happens during this this chase, chase scene is the sun starts coming up yeah which is done in such a nonchalant way that I don't think you like the first time I watched it, I didn't even realize it had become daytime until let me, let me back up. All this top 40 music is so boring. Jeez. I sure wish I had something geeky to listen to. Well, I've got just the thing for you, stranger. Who are you and how did you get in my house? Don't even worry about that. If you're looking for the latest, greatest, and geekiest podcasts around, you should check out Those Geeks You Know. Those Geeks You Know? Wow! Three friends talking about comic books, movies, TV shows, all the things that I geek out about. But seriously, you gotta leave now. Be sure to check out Those Geeks You Know on iTunes and Stitcher. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter and tell everybody that you know. You, you got to leave. I called the cops. When the German gives chase, it is nighttime. During the run, dawn starts to happen and the sky becomes lighter. He takes the jump into the river and there is a prolonged scene of him kind of floating. Like he, You had this sense of like, nobody's chasing him. He's floating down a river and it's just calm. And he can take a breath. And by the time he well, after the end of the river, it is daytime. After he goes over the waterfall, yes, that is a that is a little bit of a panic. Um, but then then it's daytime. And and it's not the first time I watched it, it wasn't until daytime where I'm like, wait, when that 
when the hell did the sun come out? So, and then watching it the second time, you see like the kind of prolonged dawn come up, which I thought was really well done. Yeah. But the part that we skipped over when he was with the girl, that's when he realizes that it's morning. The bell tolls six times. So he's like, oh shit, it's 6 a.m. Oh. I have to go. And she's like, no, stay, stay. And he's like, no, I got to go. Uh, and that's also when, so that scene I think is still kind of important because it's, Instead of the movie like expositing information about like his background to you, like that's where you start to get the sense that like, oh shit, this guy has a family. Like because earlier so, he talks about it. He talks about so it, he like, doesn't he doesn't mention having a family in that and I, and I paid close attention to this the second time around. She asks him, Do you have any children? Do you have any like a daughter or something like that? Yeah. And he doesn't answer. Yes, but you can tell by the way that he is interacting with the little girl that he has little girls. And then See, earlier, I, if you think about it, earlier when he's talking to Blake and he's like, don't go home. Like, it's better not to go home because then you don't have to worry about never seeing them again. And he like almost starts to break down. Like, he's he went home. He got leave. He went home. He saw his family. And that is like a burden on him. Because now it's like, I don't know if I will see them again. They don't, and I wish that I didn't see them so that I wouldn't have to worry about it so much right now. So then, he, he, uh, when he has that scene with Blake, it is very grounding because he does, he does make it's not just the comment he makes, it's the way he makes it. It is very direct and very, you don't want to go home because it, it, you could, you know, you're, you're going to, you might not see them again. And then, when he uh, when he interacts with the woman and the baby later, I didn't I didn't immediately think he had a family. I I just thought you know, again compassion. He's seeing a baby. He gives him food, um, and I I kind of brush it off as just him being compassionate. But it does yeah, it does so play a role later he, on. He said that he said that um, he sang that song to her, mm -hmm. and like they were like, oh, she likes you. Uh, the girl said that like she likes you. And like you could see, he was like looking at this child like it was his own. And I think that's yeah because he. I think I'm pretty sure he had like two daughters or something like that. Yeah. So so the the rest of the movie is kind of fast paced in the sense that not much happens. He goes down the river. He comes out the other end. He actually has to crawl over some bodies to get to the the shore. Oh, that was the, the, disgusting. Yeah, that was pretty bad because the I mean, you can imagine man, this yeah. river. This yeah, this river is kind of going through a war zone. So as bodies fall into it, it's just kind of collecting and pulling at the end. So he's got to crawl over these bodies. He gets to the edge of the water, goes up through the, some woods, bumps into a platoon that are listening to to one person kind of sing a song. And the song's over. Everybody gets up, and he's he's sitting there. Hey, kind don't of, gloss over that song. What song was it? Well, not the importance of the actual song, but like <laughs> how it was done. Wayfaring, well. wayfaring, uh, something. I like when that happened. I was, I'm not gonna lie, I, I was in love with that guy. Uh, I wish that, like, I had a Marine that could sing like that, that would sing us songs before we went to battle. <laughs> Serenade you. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. They they get up. The whole platoon gets up to to leave the woods and go into the foxhole or the or go into the trenches rather. The second and they wave. stop him. Yeah, and he says, you know, I'm I'm here looking for such and such, and they're like, oh, that's us. And like, well, and he's like, what? Well, have you guys not gone in yet? He's like, no, we're the second wave. The first wave is going over right now. And he makes this mad dash. And he's pushing past people and he's running through the trenches and, you know, bombs are going off and explosions are happening and people are getting ready to go over the trenches. And he's screaming out for, you know, the, the person he's here to see whose name I do not remember. Uh, let me see if I can oh, find Colonel, him. Uh, Colonel Mack. Colonel McKenzie. Colonel McKenzie. He's screaming out for Colonel McKenzie and everybody's pointing him into a certain direction. And he finally gets there. And oh, hold on. Don't, don't, don't skip past. The second terrible officer, the <laughs> captain that he runs up on, who's fucking crying. <laughs> the, he is, yeah. The captain is standing there as he's not even getting ready to go over. The rest he's of the, his troops crying. are getting ready to go over, and he's crying. He's crying profusely. 
Um, he finds Colonel McKenzie in a cutout in the trenches, and he tells Colonel McKenzie, you've got to put a stop to this. I have orders from the, the general. Colonel McKenzie um, is Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch. Sherlock Holmes himself. <laughs> I, I, I think he's a phenomenal actor. Yeah. Did not like him in this. I think that's perfect. You well, shouldn't. I, no, I didn't. I did I don't mean I don't like his okay. character. I don't uh-huh. think he was a good fit for the character. I don't. Benedict Cumberbatch is a great, nice actor, and he plays an awful colonel. He's presented with these orders from the general yeah. to to stop the invasion, and initially he says, "No, I'm not going to so do let's... that." So let's bring let's go back to uh, uh, Mark Strong as Captain Smith. What does he say? He says, "When you give him the orders, make sure there's witnesses." And yeah. Schofield says, "Sir, like, what do you what do you mean?" And Captain Smith says, "Some people just like to fight." Yeah, they just want the fight. Yes. And so when he tells him, and then, and, and then so. Um, Colonel Mack is just like um, Lieutenant Gordon, right? Like one day they tell you, you know, push, and the next day they tell you wait, and then the next the next day after that they tell you push again. Like, yeah, he he makes the comment to Schofield, you know, Schofield who has gone through hell to deliver these orders. Colonel Mack ori- initially says, "No, we're going to do it anyway." And when presented with the group of people around him, they're basically looking at him like, sir, he says, fine, call him off. And instead of saying, you know, Schofield, good job, or, you know, go, go get a a hot meal. He, he tells him, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It makes, it make, yeah. First he says it it makes no difference because in two days we're going to get orders to to push. And then he tells him, what do you, what do you, what more do you want? Go fuck off. Yeah, no, that's real life. That's real life. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way that that colonel who had spent days planning, days or weeks planning that attack, just to have it called off after he, after he has already sent the first two and a half waves or one and a half waves, right? Like mm-hmm. guys have already died. So let's, wait, I want to go back real quick. So when he decides to, he's when Schofield is like, I need to get over there. What's the fastest way? And he decides to climb over the trench and then run through the field mm-hmm. to go to the, get to the other side. So in like the first 10 seconds of him doing that, he runs into this guy. And I just, I like this happened and I just keep thinking about it. He's running across and everyone else is rushing perpendicular to him. He runs mm-hmm. into this guy that never gets back up. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's so great that you brought that up, and here's why. So in the behind the scenes stuff, the the director um, t- Sam Mendez tells the actors we're doing such long shots that if something goes wrong, keep going, keep going because who knows where I can cut this? Who knows what, what I can make up at the end? You know, don't worry about it, Schofield. Hops up, runs perpendicular as these guys are running in front of him. He gets caught up with another dude. Yeah. Not planned. It is not oh, planned. It's an accident. Okay. So he's he's trained now by the director. Go with it. So he gets up and he keeps running. The extra stays down because he's told that once you hit the ground, your character is dead. Just stay yeah. there. So he did. That's so it's awesome. funny you say that because... The, the director jokes about it afterwards that Schofield killed a man while trying to run. <laughs> <laughs> he killed a man. It's awful. <laughs> That's so funny. Because I'm like, wait, nothing happened that would have made that guy die right there. <laughs> but that makes so much sense. <laughs> so, That's hilarious. As, as Schofield is le- leaving the colonel's presence, he yeah. stopped seemingly by another officer who takes a moment to say, good job. Good yes. on you. So that is, that, so that is real life, right? So the colonel, uh, like the colonel, he spent all that time planning that. 
he had already sent a, a wave and a half over. So he knows that like he just had umpteen amount of guys die for no reason now. Because mm-hmm. in his mind, he's gonna have to send the rest of his guys back over at some point. Right. And like so so these guys just died. He doesn't accomplish anything. He's going to have to do it again. He's going to have to do all the planning again. So, like, there's no way that he's going to say to Schofield. There is no way in hell he's going to say to Schofield, good job. Right. So he says, fuck off, which is exactly what I would expect him to do. If he would have said, if in this movie he would have told Schofield, good job, go get some rest, like, <laughs> good journey, I would have hated the movie. It would have ruined the whole movie for me. Because hmm. I've told Marines myself, like, fuck off. <laughs> to fuck off, right? <laughs> like, this other, this other officer sent you over here to tell me this thing, like, that I don't like. Like, okay, I got it. Get the fuck out of here. Like, right. it's, but like, no joke. Like, it's not even their fault. That's like shooting the messenger. But, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, but that's absolutely what happened. But then, you know, another officer being there would be the one, and that's exactly how it would go in real life. I think that was extremely realistic. Another officer would come up and say, like, and it's, and I think that's how it should go. Uh, that's how it would go. Um, like, and a, someone, at least someone did it, you know? Yeah. So Schofield goes back behind the line, he finds Blake's brother. Tells him what happened. Yeah. Presents him with the rings and dog tag. Doesn't tell him his brother died like a bitch. Does not say that he died like a bitch. Instead, he says, you know, he saved my life. Um, and then he goes and finds a tree and he sits down and he pulls out a picture of his family and his daughters. Yeah. And the movie ends. Yes. Such a great movie. So before before I get your take on the movie, here's what I want to do. I have developed over many years of, of intense studies and training um, <laughs> with with the, the Sherpas in, in India. I have three <laughs> questions that will help us answer the overall purpose, which was, was this a good movie? Um, so we are going to play the three question game. Question number one, what was the message of the film and do you agree with it? So this was like a, from a military perspective, this movie was message to Garcia. You, I, know, I know that you know what message to Garcia was, but, uh, very yeah, phenomenal. You, if you haven't, if you don't know what that is, you need to Google it, but yeah. for, for your message, give us a brief summary. So, and I deal with this on a daily basis. Uh, the worst offenders of this are usually junior officers. Myself as an XO, I'm, my job is to steer them in the direction uh, that they need to go, junior officers. And uh, most of the time they suck. But message to Garcia is if someone senior to you gives you a mission, you need to. Like, it's not up to that person to tell you how to complete the mission. So I have this first sergeant, and he, and the guy is, I love him to death. He's an idiot, but I love him to death. One great thing that he says is, don't tell me how to make a watch, just tell me the time. So message to Garcia is, you get a mission, like, you complete the mission and you figure out how to do it. Like, don't ask me how to figure out how to do it. I give you the mission. You just do it. Right. So this movie is a great, um, I think a great uh, movie for that concept. Like Schofield isn't even the one that originally gets the mission, but like he figures out a way to make it happen. And that's what being in the military is about. 
Like you, when you get a mission, you complete the mission at, at all costs. Yeah, well said. Um, question number two, how did the movie leave you feeling? And do you think it was intentional? Uh, first of all, yes. And second of all, yes. So <laughs> the movie left me feeling, um, I, I think it was, it was all the right feelings. Like it, it wasn't so usually when you're in the military and you watch a movie that's based on the military, I feel like you walk away from the movie thinking about all the things they did wrong trying to portray the military. Um, in this movie, I didn't have, I think after watching it the first time, I had those, those uh, feelings like, wow, they really make officers look bad in this movie. But after watching it a second of time and having that, like, mindset in my head it showed me that like they actually don't like they portray officers in in a pretty uh pretty accurate way like because you're always gonna have bad officers like always um so i think they're very accurate with that they're very accurate on a lot of a lot of aspects of of military life and it really helped uh it really comforted me because it made me feel like anyone else could probably feel those feelings. And those are really well said. Those are real feelings. Those are, that's really well said. I think, um, one, one of the things, one of the aspects of camaraderie that you get upon exiting the military is that that same camaraderie that exists while on active duty with other active duty exists with veterans with other veterans and it's it's a different kind of like we had talked about earlier the camaraderie between active duty is you know we've both been through the same shit we both went through boot camp we both you know went through the crucible we're both marines um you know we've been through some 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 tough crap but the camaraderie when it comes to veterans much like you just kind of worded it is the sense of more the feelings like we've both been in dark places we've both had dark yeah. thoughts and it's just kind of this proverbial you know without saying it you you know that they felt the same way and um yeah i think that's really well said so question number three what is the most important sequence in the movie oh i knew you were gonna ask this question why was i not prepared for it uh, <laughs> So since the movie was shot with no cuts, can I just say all of it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so the most important sequence, um, I think it's when Blake dies. Um, so yeah, so in that sequence, right? Blake is the one that received the mission. He, like, the general said, Blake, I need you to do this. You have a brother that is over there. This is why this mission is important to you. Right? So, like, he has a personal, he has a personal um, stake in the mission. And that's why they mm -hmm. chose him. That's obviously why they chose him. Like, your brother's there and he's going to die if you do not complete this. So, when he dies, Showfield now, like he has two choices. He can say, Well, um, I don't give a shit, you know, in a sense. Like, he could, it wouldn't be like that, I guess, direct, but he could just be like, Uh, yeah, this is not my mission. Um, I'm gonna. I I, I disagree. I disagree because I think I think he has two options that you're alluding to. He doesn't have two choices. I think anybody that's been in that that sort of position knows that that is not that is not an, a, a choice. So so I agree with you. If you think about it from the outside, that's not a choice. If you think about it from a sense of, like, I received a mission, I'm going to do it, 
right? As, and especially as a person that was in the military, um, that does not seem like it's an option. Right. But, but on a individual level, like uh, on the basis of if you were the one that was actually in that position, that is definitely something that's going to flip into your mind. Oh, like he, I, yeah, he, he absolutely had. So, so at that point, it is an option. I, so I think the, to say, the, I think the thought enters his head, but, there, oh, but there's no absolutely. way there's no, cause you can't, what do you, you can't go back and say, oh yeah, Blake, Blake died. Yeah, so I, you know, he doesn't even have to go back. back though. He doesn't even have to go back. He could continue with fucking, uh, um, he can continue with the unit that picks him up. That's like, true. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, I think on an individual personal level, it is absolutely, um, absolutely an option that he has. Like he has a way out at that point too. Like he's he can just fall into the other unit, and like no one will, no one will ever know. The attack will go on. A lot of people will die, but he is not the original bearer of that mission. It's not like his personal mission to himself. Um, so with with that being said, I mean, I know I, I already know the answer to this, but I got to ask, was this a good movie? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This, absolutely. this was such a good movie you- to me. Go ahead. It it makes you. I think that even uh, from a perspective of someone that's not a military member, it still has the ability to make you feel the feelings, right? And that's like, I think that's the most important part. Like that's the mission of a movie. And what makes a bad movie or a good movie? Like there's some movies that I think um, are great movies because. And other people think they're bad movies, but I think the the reason for the movie is what makes it a good movie. So if you think it's a bad movie because it's stupid, but the movie is stupid, and then I think it's a good movie. This movie That's interesting. is like like Idiocracy. I watched your I listened to your episode on Idiocracy. Um, and Idiocracy is a great movie because like it's a movie about being stupid. So if you say that movie was if you say if you watch that movie and you come out of it saying that movie was stupid, then it did its job. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So we, it's like, we, uh, we will have to agree to disagree on that one cuz I believe I rated Idiocracy very low. It was not a, not a movie I enjoyed, but I think you did. Yeah. And I thought Idiocracy <laughs> was great because it, it accomplished the mission that I think that it was supposed to accomplish. And like, I, I guess I think about it, it may be like militaristic to think about it that way, but like some movies that don't come out uh, or don't have the reception that I, that uh, like a good reception, but like the reception that they have is accomplishing what the movie, like what the I think the producer and the director and, and all of them set to make with the movie is why the reason people don't like it. I think that's a good movie. So if I uh, set out to make a bad movie and you watch it and you think it's a bad movie, <laughs> then it's a good movie? <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's it's not as simple as that. I would say it's not as simple as that, but... um. Like it still has to be a good movie in in sense of like the artist like uh like how it's done. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, only, I'm, broad, only up, but... <laughs> I'm only busting your balls a little bit because honestly, I agree with you. This is not only a great movie, both from a military standpoint, um having the you know the, the, the military background, but just in general it's a great movie. It's a, a phenomenally shot movie and I am going to put it on my top 10. Now, I don't know if you know this because this is something we recently launched in season two. There is a top 10 list that I am currently monitoring. I can only pick movies that I have covered during the podcast. So for this one, I am going to file it at spot number three 
It is going to come just beyond, just behind Please. predestination, and just in front of murder of crows. And it's going to be knocking the king of Staten Island off the list. Nineteen seventeen, oh, number three good. on my top nice. ten movies. Fuck you, king of Staten Island. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that one yet. I listened to your podcast on it. I haven't seen it yet, so I'll watch it probably somewhat sometime soon. But I think that's definitely good. So the next thing I want to do is I want to play a little game that you are probably aware of having listened to the podcast. It's called Guess That Tomato. What we're going to do in this game before I have you guess. I purposely stayed away from looking at that. I I love it. I love it. Because that's always always my fear. Is that somebody that listens to the podcast and then gets on the podcast is going to look it up ahead of time just so they can get this preemptive, yeah. you know, oh, I know the answer. But let me give you some background. Budget of the movie is $95 million. It ends yeah. up grossing worldwide $385 million. So a yeah. huge hit. So much so it wins tons of awards. It obviously won Best Cinematography because, I mean, come on. It's, it's one of the best oh. cinematography movies I've ever seen in my life. Absolutely. Uh, wins the Oscar for that. It does not win the Oscar for Best Picture, although it was nominated for Best Picture. It loses to Parasite. Parasite. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, but it's also... I I, I haven't seen it myself, but I heard it's a great movie. I have seen it. It wins Best Original Screenplay, Best Achievement in Directing, Best Achievement in Makeup and Production Design and Sound Editing and Music from Written, and it wins Golden Globe for the Best Motion Picture. I mean, it it wins tons of awards. So... What is your guess for the Rotten Tomato score for nine or for two thousand nineteen's nineteen ninety seven or nineteen seventeen? Um, I think that it is a <clears throat> audience 92. rated 30, 30,505 people rated this movie. Is it a ninety two? I think it's a ninety two. Okay, now here are your hints. Number one, the critic score. 448 critics rated this movie in 89. I'm also going to give you three movies that are within 2% of this movie. So plus or minus 2% of this movie's audience score. Are you ready? Yeah. Movie number one, The Sisters Brothers. John C. Riley and Joaquin Phoenix's attempt at a dark Western comedy, which manages to do all of them poorly while still being mildly entertaining. Fuck. I literally just watched this or listened to this podcast, but I do not remember the rating. <laughs> number two, Hereditary. 2018's disturbing oh, horror movie that asks the question, what if demons weren't the worst part of your family? Uh, and number three, Wind River. A movie that follows Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch as wow. they investigate the death of the Punisher and his girlfriend. This is, oh my god, I feel so terrible because I literally <laughs> watched all these in the last like I listened to all these in the last month and I don't remember any of the ratings. Um, so you, okay, you originally guessed ninety two. Did you want? Do you want to change that guess? Yes. Uh. So all those, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go down to 82. 82. The correct answer is. <laughs> 88. Oh, you were that close. was close. You were close. That was good. You had yeah. critics saying that the film is thrilling. Um, the way in which the film is choreographed, the music is very important. The film actually stops bringing everyone together in a quintessential religious silence. Every moving, yeah. very moving and effective. One of the things I really wanted to point out about the movie that I didn't get a chance to while we were talking about it is um, the director said that several times th- the motion of the camera is so important to the film because there are yeah. scenes that the camera is intended to feel like it's pulling the two main characters on their mission. Um, not yes. just following, them, but yes. pulling them along. And I definitely yeah, like got when that they sense. come over the when they come over uh, to do the first like um, movement into the trench. 
the camera mm -hmm. goes the opposite way of them. So when they come over with their rifles, the camera is seeing them do it. It's going the opposite way of them. And I think that's, yeah, that, that's what they're talking about there. That was, that was awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and talking to me about this movie. Thanks for catching up. Any, any last thing you want to say about the movie or anything you want to plug anything that's going on in your life? So I was really applauding, uh, Sam Mendes for this movie. And I did not realize that he was the same director that did Spectre and that other James Bond movie, which I think were horrendous. Really? Um, yeah. I think that I thought both of those movies were horrendous. Um, usually you ask people, are you going to ask me what I'm nerding out about? I, I was, that was the next thing I was going to say. It's a firm okay. belief of the owners. Don't forget a towel that everybody geeks out on something while it may not be comic books and movies. Maybe it's trench warfare and dog fighting. So Vance, I have to ask you, what is it that you are currently geeking out on? Okay. So as you know, the listeners might not know, but I live in Japan right now. I've always been a car guy. And so that's what I'm geeking out on. I have a 1997 Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution 4. Mm -hmm. And I also have a 2012 Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution 10 that's still in the States being built. And literally, I spend almost every second of every day looking up like car parts and uh, tunes. And like, I. If, if you're going to ask me what I'm geeking out about, it's on JDM cars <laughs> and how to make them cooler and faster. <laughs> I can see that things have not changed. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what has changed is when you knew me, I had all these shitty cars and now I have like less shitty cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. I'm, I'm, listen, I couldn't be more proud of you. As quintessential as that sounds, um, you, you're doing great. And I'm, I'm really just, I'm proud to know you. And again, thank you for your service. I uh, really appreciate you doing this well, with me, thank man. Thank you for yours. Thank you for yours. And I'm telling you, uh, if this goes well and you put it on your site, I want to be on there when you do tenant. Done. It's on the calendar. If that comes up, which I have not seen it yet, but if that comes up, you are definitely going to be my guest. Okay. Thanks, man. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. You've got Gutsy Media Podcast. Leave a message about any movies you've covered, and maybe we'll add to the show. Thanks. Hey, Gutsy Media, this is Alec Weck, number one downloaded podcaster on your favorite station, Gutsy Media. I'm calling about 1917 today, one of my all-time favorite movies. And, in fact, we actually discussed it in our last episode a little bit, uh, which is episode three of season two, so I encourage all your listeners to download it. But let me tell you about 1917. Fantastic movie. It's up there in the pantheon of all-time great movies. And what I love about it most is that it gives a rival – to Saving Proper Ryan. Every great movie needs a rival. Godfather 1, Godfather 2. Uh, Showgirls, Striptease, Saving Private Ryan, 1917, Zoolander, Zoolander 2. Just amazing films that are unrivaled, unparalleled, fantastic. They're really just two amazing movies at the top of their game. 1917, if you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. It's absolutely fantastic. Direction, story, pacing, cinematography, it is all the best you will see um, in a long time, and it's right up there with any great war movie. Thanks.